Oh, a lovely day today. Lovely afternoon. Yeah. What a, uh, great. Great. I've just, I've just, just kicked the kids back in the house and said, I'm just doing another webinar. In you, in you get. So I'll have them, I'll have them out after this and get a bit of sunshine. Okay, so everybody's coming in. Welcome everyone to the afternoon webinar. Now, the subject of this webinar is fire premature collapse. Um, mm. I did a video on YouTube a couple of years ago where I was challenging the regulation with regards to the application of it and the retrospectiveness of the regulations and basically trying to get people to think about the agenda you know, the intention of the regulation. I wanted just to explain it more. I didn't think that the industry was doing enough at the time. Now, because we have our time to do this, and because Dan and I are available, I thought it'd be a good idea to bring this up again. And a bit of background about my dad is he was in the fire service for a period of time. And so what I'm going to do is just go through the generic... Leave it all. Hello. Uh, I'm going to go through the content of the video that I did. I'm not going to play. I'm just going to go through the slides again and bring up the, the case. And um, Pop's going to jump in if ever he feels it. And then I just want really his viewpoint on any of the little parts of this. Because um, whenever we talk about premature collapse, what's your opinion on the word premature here, Pop? Ah, well, yeah, it's... Um... <sighs> We can often talk about premature collapse um, from a firefighting point of view in the view to the actual evacuation of buildings. Okay, mm. uh, We talk about the premature collapse or the uh, premature collapse of uh, building structure. Um, um, we talk about uh, doors, where your standard sort of internal door would normally hold a fire back for about 20 minutes. Your mm. plasterboard ceiling would normally um, hold a fire and smoke back for 20 minutes. And if it fails before that, we're talking about a premature collapse. Yeah, so a lot of these premature, are premature failure. But these periods of time are mainly to aid escape. Is that correct? This is all about people getting out of the building. Okay, mm. this is totally different to firefighting activities that go on following the advent of the fire, uh, and, and you find it in, in, depending on where you are in the country, mm. um, you might not get a fire engine for. 10 15 minutes okay well, um, if, before maybe before we get into this maybe you should just quickly give us your background all right okay well i was um yeah i was in the fire service as a uh, retained firefighter so I was, I was on call um a bit like the lifeboat guys uh so i carried on being an electrician um running an electrical contracting firm and i carried a pager and i if there was a call we used to hot foot it i could actually run in those days uh, to the fire station uh, and I had 18 years in the fire service um, nine years I was actually in charge of a fire station and that's what got me into the training um, which is why I ended up in teaching and training so um, as the fire the station commander I was responsible for the training of all the guys and girls on the station any new recruits we brought in maintaining the actual skills and whatever of the existing uh, crew and any new technologies, any new ideas that came in, it was up to me to make sure that was passed on and, and given to all, all the crew so everybody was kept up to date. So that's what got me into training. And I was based at Ascot. Um, I had an office at the race course where I ran my contracting firm. And, um, you know, it was just within, over the road, wasn't it? Yeah, it was within running distance. Um, yeah. Running distance for me is, is not so far as maybe for some other people, but it was within my running distance. So I was able to uh, attend uh, to any fires that happened during the day while I was at work. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my background, 18 years in the fire service. Uh, and obviously we've, we've seen all sorts of stuff and, you know, ranging from domestic fires to industrial fires, commercial fires. Uh, I went to Windsor Castle when that uh, caught light, uh, spent a whole weekend there. So yeah, a whole range of different experiences and whatever, um, looking at different types of building and uh, dealing with fires in those cool 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 okay so um i'll just go through the regulation that we're talking about mm -hmm. um so we're talking about this regulation here so 521.10.202 which obviously has kind of evolved from the third amendment it was introduced as 17th edition where it was for escape routes 
um, when it was first implemented. And all they've done really, because that was 521.11, I think, it's now just been put into .10.202, which basically comes into all reach. Okay. Uh, and so the wording is here, they will not be liable to premature collapse in the event of a fire. Um, this premature is a word that we keep we keep chewing on, don't we? Trying to understand yeah. as to the intention of this. Because I've attended events and seminars where I, I've seen things like 30 minutes, etc. thrown at me. Plasterboard ceilings above plasterboard ceilings is sufficient for premature collapse. But what, I, what, I, what I've got in this presentation is, you know, the, the actual root cause of this regulation coming in. So for us to determine what premature really means in this. Um, just for completeness, yeah. Wiring systems are to be supported such that they are not liable to premature collapse in the event of a fire. A wiring system that hangs across an access or egress route could hinder evacuation. And this is important, the firefighting activity, which you're going to explain to us, can take quite a sufficient period of time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah? yeah. Um, cables installed in or on steel containment systems are deemed to meet the requirements of this regulation. It precludes, for example, the use of non-metallic cable clips or cable ties as a sole means of support. And that's why we have things like, you know, uh, the linear clips. Um, we have the FIFI clips and all these other clips that are coming in as supplementary fixings all try to support the wiring systems. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, simply spaced steel or copper clips, saddles or ties, examples will meet the requirements of this regulation. Yeah. And I want to just also show 5839. Let me click her up here. Uh, which tells us uh, 58391 clause 262F methods of cable support should be non combustible such that the circuit integrity is not reduced below that afforded by the cable use and should withstand similar temperature and duration to that of the cable. This is in the same section as it talks about escape, but it does say in the note here, um, note 11. Experience has shown that collapse of cable supported by the plastic cable trunking can create serious hazards for firefighters who could become entangled in cables. Is there anything you wanted to add before I go through the, the three case studies? Uh, right, consider, all right, and this is the issue um, when people are thinking about these things. We're looking at uh, systems and buildings in the cold light of day. Yeah. Um, what you've got to consider is what firefighters are actually doing in those buildings. These buildings are alight, okay? They're hot, mm -hmm. uh, they're full of toxic gases. Um, and the best way I can describe it is to um, go into a sauna, yeah? Mm -hmm. Put, put a, a blindfold on, mm -hmm. put oven gloves on your hands, all right? And put a backpack on, and then throw a load of cables in there, all right? Uh, over the top of you, and then find out if you can get yourself untangled. Mm. Right, and this is this is the issue: is that people don't understand what firefighters are dealing with when they go into these buildings. You can't see where you're going. You've got thick black smoke. Visibility. We're trained to actually uh, search these buildings um, with no sight at all. We're, we're trained to do it blindfolded. They actually put masks on us so we can't see what we do. So during training, we actually do it without any vision at all. And so you don't, you this, don't rely on sight at all? No, it's all done by touch. Everything is done by touch. Mm -hmm. Okay? And you're going in normally in groups in teams of two. Quite often, if it's a larger building, you might have a belt line on you. So you've got a, a, a piece of rope between you anyway, a string. Mm -hmm. Okay? You've got these gloves on, so dexterity is, is quite restricted. All right? You've got a breathing apparatus pack on your back. All right? You're, wearing, you're working in high humidity very low if no vision at all all right and you've got this fire burning so there's a lot of noise going on you've got communications between yourself and the guy or the or the, or the, uh, the girl that you're with okay trying to actually communicate between yourselves you're trying to communicate with the people outside there's all this stuff going on and what you've got to remember with firefighters is everything's done by touch yeah uh if you're going up and down stairs we, we will go up forwards we will come downstairs backwards, right? Just in case the stair that we're coming onto has collapsed, or was given way during the fire, firefighters will come downstairs backwards. So you walk down backwards, is that so the so, way you're- So you're, le you're leaning forward and you're yeah. testing each step as you go and you're coming down backwards. If the step has gone because it's been burnt away, then if you fall, you will fall onto the steps that you are in front of you, you know, as you're coming down. If okay. you come down forwards and the step's gone, you'll just go head first down the stairs 
Mm. Okay, so you're coming down with a big apparatus set on your back. Any cables that are laying across that staircase are going to go immediately if they're dangling down to a certain set. They're actually going to get caught straight underneath your breathing apparatus set. Mm -hmm. The first thing you're going to know about it is when you feel that restriction. So then you're going to sort of turn around, you're going to try and untangle yourself. You end up wrapping yourself up in the cables anyway. All right. right? It's, it's, you know, we, we look at it in the cold light of day. You've got to try and put yourselves in the firefighter's position. Yeah. yeah. Of this limited dexterity, limited, extremely limited vision, limited communication. Okay, you can't see what's going on, and last thing you want is cables falling on all around you. You know, to just add another safety factor, another hazard to your environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So <clears throat> these are the case studies. This this information is on the video I put on YouTube two years ago, but I want to go there for a completeness. So we have 2005 Harrow Courts. There was a flat on fire. Two firefighters died and a member of the public was killed. Uh, investigation found that there was insufficient money on the meter. And that meant the mains powered smoke alarms weren't obviously working. So they couldn't just escape. The processes that we assume of, oh, they can escape, were not sufficient. That meant, therefore, a rescue was required. Um, there was obviously an issue with regards to the the concern here, if you run out of power and you're, you know, you don't replace the battery or test the battery in your smoke alarm and you rely on electric, if you've got a key meter with no power, then you're going to have insufficient um, fire alarm. What happened in this situation is a tea light without a proper holder was left lit. Someone fell asleep in the bed and it was on a TV and it melted the TV and the TV caught fire. The um, fire took place with a lady in the bedroom um, and somebody else was also in the property in the corridor. And they actually, one person managed to survive. But what happened, and this is, this, is, this is a bit of the investigation, it was apparent that the water was locked off in the flats. The valve was locked off because of due to, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, Pop, where uh, you know, people would um, just vandalize hydrants or whatever, and still be a lock off or there'll be some kind of locking off mechanism. So the, the two firefighters that arrived went up to the door without water. So they actually went to the front door and they could hear people behind the door screaming for help. But they had no water ready because the water wasn't available. So there was some issue with the rate it was tackled. So these two firefighters kicked the door in. And this is where we had, um, it's called here a flashover. So the doors kicked in, a fresh supply of oxygen turned what was a smoldering fire producing thick suffocating smoke. Remember there's voices going on the other side of the door. Gentleman was saved and treated by the, th the third firefighter in the corridor, but two went in to try to rescue this other person in the bedroom. And this is this is from the BRE, the Building Research Establishment. The investigation researched after recreating the fire discovered a 180 degree to 800 degree flashover within 60 seconds of opening the door. So, in what kind? I mean, there's quite a range of temperatures there, Pop. I mean, uh, we are really looking at is this 800 degree potential? Is that regular if we're going to introduce huge amounts of oxygen to a fire when tackling it? You're muted. Still, yeah. Right. Yep. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's two things that we considered when I was in the fire brigade, and remember that I've I've been out the fire brigade now for 10 years or so. Um, thank goodness they say looking at me now. Um, but, um, yeah, when I was in the fire brigade, we talked about two particular situations. One was flash over. The other one was backdraft. And um, remember the film backdraft. Movie, yeah. Where, you know, where people go flying through the air. Uh, flash over. What is flash over? Flash over is a situation where when you've got a room, uh, with furniture and furnishings and other combustibles in it. Okay. Uh, they can very rapidly, a very small fire can develop very rapidly into a raging inferno. As the fire builds up, the heat in the room will increase and increase and increase. Mm. And generally about, I'm thinking about, where is it? About um, about 600 degrees, between 500 and 600 degrees, yeah, equipment and materials start to pyrolyze. By that, I mean, they start giving off a vapor. Now, okay. we generally think of, you know, for things to catch fire, you've got to hold them in a flame. You know, if we light a candle, we've got to, we've got to hold the wick in the flame. And we generally tend to think, oh, for something to catch fire, it's got to be in contact with that flame. But it doesn't, it doesn't actually need to be. Mm. In a contained environment that where the heat is, builds up and it gets so intense, we get this business of pyrolyzation where materials start to break down and they give off a very flammable vapor. Well, it's a vapor then, yeah. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can actually see this. And we're, we're trained in the fire service when we go into a room is to crack the door open, have a look inside. And you're looking for things like pyrolization of materials. You're looking for things for like what we call dancing angels going across the ceiling. These, these uh, tongues of flame licking across the ceiling. All right. And what we used to be told to do was to just you'd bear a team or two and you'd crack the door open and then you would put a couple of pulses of water into the smoke layer, into the heat layer at the ceiling to try to reduce that temperature. Um, obviously, uh, things might have changed now. I've been out of the job for 10 years or so. Things might have developed, you know, mm. as, as fire engineering sort of continues to keep the pace of everything. So I might be slightly behind the times. But in those days, we were told, crack the door open mm -hmm. and you used to have to hold on to the door. Well, this happened in 2005. Yeah. You were in the service there, yeah. weren't you? Yeah, I was, yeah. yeah. And so you put a couple of pulses of water into the, and you would try and cool that down. Because what will happen is eventually, if that isn't cooled down, eventually your room will get to a point, yeah, about, um, about 900 degrees or somewhere like that, or, or even less, where mm -hmm. suddenly this whole vapor okay and the combustibles in the room will erupt and it's almost like an explosion and suddenly the whole room will basically erupt into fire now if you're in that room before that happens at the lower levels because obviously the higher you stand or you know the higher you are the hotter it is we're mm. always taught to be crawling around on all fours or even lower you know on our bellies sometimes because it's so hot yeah but the lower levels it might only be 300 degrees or so but when that flashover happens Okay, that room will erupt into, and the whole room temperature will increase to over a thousand degrees. Mm. Now, if you're in there, you'll be extremely lucky to get out. Yeah, mm. uh, and it, it it can go higher. That's a flashover. Uh, that's a really dangerous po uh, situation. That's it kills a lot of firefighters. A lot of firefighters that die in the US is because of flashover. Right. It's a really dangerous situation for firefighters. The other one is backdraft. Backdraft is where you've got a sealed room and the fire happens and it burns all the oxygen in the room. And because it's sealed, the fire dies down. Mm. And then you get this sort of black smoke and a cherry red glow. And then what happens is that some unsuspecting firefighter walks into the room or opens the door, Gives reintroduces the oxygen. oxygen, and yeah. there's an almighty great big whoosh. Yeah. And then as you see it in the film backdraft where the guy goes flying through the air. Okay, that, that's a backdraft. It's a different thing to flashover. Mm. Yeah? Flashover is where a room reaches a certain temperature where all the material is pyrolyzed, you've got all these vapors, and then there's suddenly whoosh. It's just a, a raging inferno. And you're looking at over a thousand degrees, well over a thousand degrees in some cases. Anybody in that room, you know, you're really mm. lucky to get out of that. Okay. Okay, well, trying to rescue the lady from the bedroom. Obviously, the gen well, they got the gentleman out, but they tried to get the lady out. Uh, apparently, firefighter Michael Miller on the left here got caught in the intense fire and died almost instantly. So he's probably in this flashover event, most likely. Um, the other firefighter here, Jeff Warnham, however, was found in the lobby. This is the gentleman that was actually found in the lobby outside of the flat, and he had the cables um, were found actually in the palm of his hand. They'd melted. And here's an image of the lobby. So you can see, obviously, you've got the, the two flats there in the lobby, and you can see this cable sweeping down. The intense heat has obviously required, uh, resulted in these, these wiring systems just melting down. Um, so this was, this was back in 2005. Uh, this is a, a statement from the Fire Brigade Union back then. Um, distressing as it is, particularly for the friends and family members involved, Attention needs to be drawn to evidence that Firefighter Miller appears to have been killed instantly inside the bedroom of Flat 85. Whilst Firefighter Warnham has found on the floor of the lobby immediately outside, entangled in the electrical cabling that had fallen as a result of the plastic cable trunking having melted. Moreover, specific attention should be drawn to the evidence that Firefighter Warnham was found entangled in the cabling with melted plastic fire alarm cable insulation adhered to the inside palm of his glove rather than being found in the electrical cabling simply lying on top of him. So there's obviously, you know, he is trying to physically remove himself from this cabling. The FBU believes this evidence indicates that unlike Firefighter Miller, Firefighter Warren actually was somehow able to make his way out of the flat or was already outside of the flat before becoming entangled in the cabling that had fallen in the lobby outside. In either circumstances, the FBU concluded it was outside the flat that the firefighter had lost his life. So... This is one of the first precursors to suggest that poor wiring methods, 
poor installation methods had resulted in the death of a fire firefighter. And it was recorded with the coroner's statement. Um, the next case study is 2007. If we, if we could just stay with that one a second. Yeah. Um, what we got to think of, and it's quite distressing to think of the plight of those two young guys, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's really distressing thinking of what they went through. What we've got to consider is the fact that, you know, we talk about people being entangled in cables. Yes. When you've got a situation, firefighters are trained to look for things like flashover happening. Yeah. yeah. So they're trained to keep an eye on the fire behavior that they think we're looking for dancing angels, increasing temper, and this, that, and the other. If that happens, they've got a few seconds to get out. Yeah? Seconds. Seconds. They've got a few seconds. They may have five or six seconds to get out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that five or six seconds, if they if they're not entangled, if they've got nothing to restrict them getting out, they can get outside that room, shut that door. Yeah. The flashover will still happen, but it'll happen inside the room with the door shut. Mm. Yeah? They've literally got seconds. So any sort of interruption, any sort of um, um, delay in them getting out could put their lives at risk. And in this case, obviously it did. So, you know, people think, well, oh, surely if you get tangled up, you know, it'll only take you a couple of minutes to get yourself untangled. You haven't got a couple of minutes. In, in these sort of situations, firefighters need to react. Fire is a dynamic uh, business. It's a dynamic en enemy and it changes and the behaviors change all the time. And firefighters are looking for this. Remember that firefighters are going in. It's their job. They're trained to do it. They're going in to save lives. Yeah. And most firefighters, if they know there's a life to be saved, will think, you know, they won't think twice. They'll just put the, put the BA suggested. and they'll uh, just go in and they'll yeah. do it. Yeah? I suggested with these two who kicked the door with no water in. Uh, if um, if they know there's a, fire, a life to be saved. Um, yeah. And I remember going years ago, we went out to a, a fire. I won't tell you the circumstances, but there was only a very minimal crew, shall we say, on the pump. All right, and it was a fire involving a house, and there was a woman and three kids. Okay, and we didn't actually have all the right gear and all the right setup at the mm. time. We were actually supposed to be off the run, right? But we were sent anyway because of the location of the house. Yeah, and the whole point of sending us was Back if up. there was a life to be saved, all we right. would have got there probably about five, ten minutes before any other pump. Yeah, and it was a case of get there and if you can save a life, save a life. And we turned up at this building and it was flames and smoke coming out of everywhere. And we'd already made our minds up. If we, if we could do a snatch rescue, we would, knowing that we wouldn't have time or, or the, the, the benefit of being able to get water and hoses and stuff. Mm. Luckily, when we turned up, the woman was in the garden with her three kids crying her eyes out, but they were all out of the house. Then the whole scenario changes. You can then tackle the fire from outdoors. Yeah, but if there's a life to be saved, firefighters will go in. Mm. That's what they do. Yeah, and you know we've we've got a, we've got a responsibility to try to prevent these hazards. You know, to help to help mm. these people. It, 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 I just beg us belief that you know anybody would be happy to leave a wiring system which they know could collapse. Yeah, in a situation where firefighters may end up going in to try and save a life. Yeah, yeah. Interesting you say if there's a life to save, because the episode on Stour one, where the roof collapsed, um, the four firefighters at Paris, the, they entered into an already evacuated building. So was this, I mean, yeah, was this a case that, of delivering? When, you know, when was this? 2007. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's, it, things have changed over the years, but towards the end of my firefight, firefighting career, should we say, um, things were changing. We used to go into buildings. It used to be a case of preserve life, protect property, and sort of look after animals and stuff like that, and the mm. environment. Okay, that became more of a case of preserve life and uh, render humanitarian services. I think was the wording. Okay, and environmental services, protecting property became less. Probably things like this for the reason that now. Yeah, it was a case of when you turned up, we used to have to do a risk assessment. Uh, we used to do a dynamic risk assessment because we didn't have time to write it down. Which all adds on to your response time, doesn't yeah. it? As soon as you, as soon as you had the tar chance, you would grab hold of a, a gopher and say, "Right, write my risk assessment down." But if there was no life to be saved, the ruling became towards the end of my career. Um, consider, reconsider before you send firefighters into an empty building. But this was like 2000 and 
2009, 2010. Yeah. Uh, and these guys, it's 2007. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so practices have changed. But this, this, the, is, this is why it's so important that factories work with their fire marshals to have the numbers so that by the time the fire brigade arrives, there's already a head count and everyone's accounted for to assist yeah. you in that dynamic assessment, surely. Yeah, but depending, depending on what's going on, I mean, in this case, the factory, I believe, it, it, the fire could be almost out, you know, or... And it, you get to a situation where you might be sent in to damp down. Mm. Uh, there might be gas cylinders that need to be cooled down and moved because they're in our danger. Okay. So there's all sorts of things that the firefighters might be doing when they're going into a building. I, I believe I read even, up on when it's gone. I read up on this one. I believe that the source of the fire took hours to actually locate. It was, this, I mean, everybody got out, but the source of the fire took ages to identify. Yeah. Uh, and yes. that's, that's probably why a lot of people started to actually get into the building. Yeah. There comes a point with every fire, even if you've got an empty building, there comes mm-hmm. a point when you've either, you've got to end up putting it out somehow because you've got to think about fire spread. You've yeah. got to think about the hazards. As I say, you think you know, gas cylinders, you've got chemicals, all sorts of other things that might be there. Um, so you, you, there comes a point where you could send a team of guys in to do what, what we call sort of damping down or finding the seat of the fire and doing that and dealing with that. Mm-hmm, but if, mm-hmm. if if a building structure has been affected, and this is another thing that we're trained to try and sort of spot, if you see that a building structure has been affected, then basically you say, right, okay, nobody goes in there. But especially yeah. with steel structures, like these big warehouses, it's very difficult because you can never quite tell when these steel structures are going to give way. You know, sometimes it's really obvious because the beams are all buckled and twisted. And you think, oh, there's no way we're going in there. Mm. Other times, there's no sign of that. Mm. And then sort of like an hour later, the whole thing just kills over. You think, wow, what happened there? Mm. Mm. Yeah, so um, when the, obviously when, when, uh, when there is a fatality, there's obviously an immediate investigation. And obviously a lot of other firefighters that were in the building did report that there were numerous cases of electrical equipment and cable being basically an obstruction to escape from the building. So they're not sure on what the cause of death was, whether it was roof caving or suffocation. But the, as you say, you know, they're going to need to get out quick. There was a reported case of cables entangling people or, or slowing down the escape process. So these were also brought up. And so the fire rescue service actually issued an operational bulletin uh, and included hanging cable hazards from surface mounted conduit and trunking were included in that. And that's where BRE, the building research establishment, actually um, started getting involved in doing studies on cables and entanglement the work confirmed that plastic conduit trunking surface mounted on ceilings and walls may fail at relatively low temperatures 150 degrees to electricians that's a high temperature but obviously to, to, to it's fire nothing. Fire service, it's, that's absolutely that, nothing it's a walk in the park to a firefighter you know we, yeah. generally firefighters going into a buildings even with a fairly sort of reasonable size fire you know you'd be looking at 300 degrees um uh sort of like sort of head height and as I say, we used to go to fire service college. We used, mm-hmm. they used to shove us in buildings and set fire to them with these big cribs full of wood. And you can actually t- detect and see the different layers of temperature in the, in the fire. If yeah. you stood up too far, yeah, you, you very shortly your head would be, oh, hang on, I'm, I'm boiling here. And then you end up sort of kneeling down. And then as the fire developed, you'd end up on the floor. Yeah. Um, and yeah, temperatures, temperature 150 degrees is absolutely nothing. No, absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing you know, in most buildings when you've got building fires. That brings us to the third of the case study, which is Shirley Towers. This was obviously 2010. This was the main catalyst that pushed everything through with the evidence from 2005 and 2007. Two firefighters died here. Uh, This situation was, I don't know if my mouse is appearing here. Uh, These flats were on multi-story, so you go front door here, upstairs to a living space, living quarters and kitchen, and up some other stairs to a other living space then upstairs to a higher level exit so you actually can go in for a front door up to another level then out on another floor in this property what happened is they were doing some hoovering and they put a curtain onto a up lighter you know those, those halogen up lights and they were doing some hoovering cleaning they put the curtain on the up lights and they left it there and it caught fire and what happened is a team of firefighters came in and as you say they went in two at a time so the first two went in they went they did this thing called uh right or something where they stick by turning right looking up and so they went past the fire remember that they, they up remember the firefighters are, are, are working blind 
yeah. and it's all done by touch. So basically what you go in is you do, you, you follow a wall. So follow the wall. You, so yeah. basically you're given a brief. I used to send guys in the building and say, right, this team here, yeah. right hand wall. This team but here, left hand wall. Technically, that, if you, if you follow... Brief. If you follow the wall, you'll technically eventually cover the whole room, or the whole building, wouldn't you? Because you're going. Yeah, so, so if you go down a corridor, you find a door. Yeah. And generally, what you would do is you would then do a door entry procedure, go into that room, you would size it first of all. If it's a cupboard or something like that, you can bang it out. If it's a very small room, you might bang it out. But your brief might be just go down this corridor, okay? Uh, because you might actually have some sort of indication from outside the building where. The, the life that you're hoping to save could be it. You could look at it from the outside and think, oh, hang on, it's yeah. the third room down. So you say to the guys, right, go down the corridor, find the third room on the right, okay? So they would go down, okay, and they would try and locate this room, and then they'd go into that room and search it. Remember, they're doing all this without any vision. Mm. You know? So it's all done by touch. Mm. And then they've got to try and remember the way out afterwards as well. Yeah, in a building they're not familiar with. In, uh, they can't you know, see. They, they, they can't, can't see. Yeah, yeah. That, is, that is pretty scary. So the two went in. They went past the fire, actually, that's there. Um, and they went in, and they went up the stairs. And then two went in to assist with the hose. That's correct, isn't it? They uh, handled yeah. the hoses up the stairways, because yeah. there's lots of stairways here. And so what happened is they kind of met at a point. And then the two that went in first carried on, and then they opened a door. And that, again, introduced oxygen, which made this fire down here roar and climb now the two that went in first those two guys made it out out of this doorway onto a higher level but the two that went in to assist with the hoses got entangled and trapped on the stairways with the cables that's the theory um the the study shows you this is where the stairways are you know so you come in here up here then you go up here and it's you know it's not a lot of an area but this cabling basically um, killed them. Well, remember what I said, they're coming down those stairs backwards. Yeah. They're coming down those stairs backwards with breathing apparatus sets on, gloves. Um, a huge amount you know, of heat, isn't it? So it's really quick. They cannot see, they've got no vision, they're coming down those staircase backwards. Okay. Yeah. Any cables there are going to be this added hazard. I mean, generally, you can follow the hoses out, so it's not a case of they're getting lost. Yeah. They're not getting lost at all. They knew what they were doing. You know, they just so, had to follow their hoses out. But the cables restricted their passage. Right. Yeah. So they've made they've made way. Obviously, oxygen's been introduced by the other two who are further up. The fire behind them has obviously escalated, hmm. and they're trying to get out, which is the way they came in through the hoses. But all this stuff's falling on top of them. Is that what we think? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because they're not lost. They know where they are. You know. You know. Yeah. They've got no vision, but they hmm. know where they're going because they're following the hoses. Obviously, they brought the hoses in, so the hoses must lead to outside. Mm. So, you know, when you've got no vision and you're in a, you know, a place you're not familiar with, the easiest way to get out is to follow the hose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you've got loads of cables, look at those cables down that staircase. You know, you're going down there backwards with no vision, with a breathing apparatus set on your back. You know, you're going to get tangled up. You're going to get all sorts of problems there. Mm. And as you say, if you get tangled, you can't just sit and sort it out. The heat, the... No, you can't. Intensity, if, you're going you're gonna to get knocked out. Right. You are, you're breathing air from a cylinder. Mm. In, in, with the best of intentions, even if you are physically fit and not doing much, those last about 40 minutes if you're really lucky. If you're working hard, a breathing apparatus set in those conditions with high heat, high humidity, working hard, sometimes you can breathe those down in a quarter of an hour. Mm. Now remember, you've got, if you've got a quarter of an hour out of a breathing apparatus set, that means you've got seven and a half minutes to get in, seven and a half minutes to get out. Right. You know, it's not a quarter of an hour to get in and do what you need to do and then make your way out. You know, you, you're using that air, getting in and getting out. So you've got a very restricted amount of time. So if you're then delayed on that staircase by even a 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, trying to untangle yourself, it makes all the difference between getting out alive or not. Yeah? And that is the issue. You know, people don't realise what firefighters are doing and the environments they're working in. Yeah. Um, and if they did, they would look at this whole issue of cable support and this business of premature collapse from a totally different point of view, you know, and that's, you know, we, you know, when we, when we come on to coding and stuff like that, that's why I say to you, you know, if I'm looking at a building, 
and I make a call on it and I say, oh, this is a C2 or this is a C3 or oh, that's okay, you know, it's not mm. retrospective. Am I happy then to go and stand next to those firefighters' families and say, <laughs> oh, yeah, I, 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 I called it that, you know, because I thought it was all right, you know, it's not retrospective. It was, it was that exact theory, that, that that thought process that I went through as to why I made the video two years ago because the industry at the time was going, oh, it's not retrospective, it's not retrospective. And I was yeah. like, really? You know, we've got to do something for existing wiring systems to protect yeah, firefighters, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. So this is a quite a famous picture that's been used for premature collapse. Yeah. It's obviously the lobby of of this building and uh, the two gentlemen that obviously died. Okay, so all of this created this thing called a Rule 43 letter. So on provisions of Rule 43, the coroner's rules, a coroner who believes actions should be taken to prevent the recurrence of fatality. So they're seeing a trend, they're seeing a problem. Yeah. They mm. can announce the inquest that is uh, reporting the matter in writing to the personal authority that may have power to make such action and may report the matter accordingly. So, you know, this could go towards a letter that would then, in the case of building regulations. So in Harricourt and Shirley Towers, the coroner's issued recommendations through a Rule 43 letter concerning social housing providers about support of fire alarms as a minimum to 5839 part one. And in Shirley Towers, further recommendations included a mention of the building regulations to be amended. That pushed through, obviously, into BS 7671 at the time, the, uh, the introduction of the regulation. Yeah, but, you know, it's in BS 7671, but, you know, we've read it and you've looked at it and, you know, premature collapse. I mean, that is, that's a wishy-washy <coughs> statement to make. The uh, the, yeah, the frustration is when I when I sit at exhibitions and I I look at people who aren't from the fire industry and they explain to what they explain to me what premature collapse means and they use terms like you know plasterboard having thirty to ninety minutes and all this stuff. Yeah, just, a lot of people say twenty minutes. You know, and kind of thing that's got nothing to do with the intention of this regulation. The regulation is here due to a rule forty three letter where firefighters have died, which you know. Um, it could be quite a serious amount of time after the actual fire, even after people have escaped. So, um, yeah, it is... I've got I've got this the IT guide. Yeah, yeah. Kind of so it's for yeah, yeah, uh, and it does say in there um, purpose of regulations prevent wiring system supports failing under fire conditions, cables dropping or hanging across access or egress routes, which may have the potential to hinder evacuation and firefighting activities. Okay, so firefighting activities, if we break firefighting activities down, firefighting activities, first of all, save lives. So enter, search and save, mm -hmm. put the fire out. Okay, and then you've got damping down and making safe and, and preventing fire spread to other buildings. Okay, yeah. okay, so firefighting activities encompasses all of that. Firefighters are going to be in those buildings in some cases for hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We need to make sure that the wiring systems are not collapsing. Mm. Not 20 minutes, not 30 minutes. We need to make sure they're not collapsing. So if I had a, if I had a room and I've got a plasterboard ceiling, yeah. or even maybe a suspended ceiling with a grid, could that yeah. collapse? Is there any issue with that for a firefighter? Is that a fairly easy object? object suspended, to... suspended, uh, suspended ceilings will fall down fairly quickly. Yeah, you know, so is, is, ones, for a firefighter, is that is that not a problem because it's quite robust and easy to move around, or what? What's the? No, they not great problems. Uh, there's been a few mentions already from from some of the guys on the chat. Data cabling, communication yeah, cabling. that's cabling. I'm on about I'm on about the grid ceiling bit itself, the structure of the ceiling. Well, quite often they'll actually have been collapsed before the firefighters get in there. Mm. Yeah, if if you're going into a building where you know there's a suspended, you can actually fairly quickly see there's a suspended ceiling. If you know the suspended ceiling's there, in some cases, the firefighters will actually pull it down, knowing that it's going to collapse anyway. Knowing, so they'll pull that down. They'll actually yeah. pull it, so it's less of a hazard. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's it's, it's you know it's much yeah. less hazard to actually pull something down and have it, you know, fall down or come down by a deliberate action. Than for it to actually fall on top of your head. You so know, would you say? Accident. So would you say for us to think that a suspended ceiling or even a plasterboard ceiling would be sufficient support to protect against premature collapse? Would you say that's a bit naive? A, sus a suspended ceiling, your standard suspended ceiling with the tiles in it and stuff like that, uh, it's 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 not going to stand a chance in a decent fire. It's yeah. going to come down. Okay. okay? Right. So from a firefighting point of view, we would expect to see those on the floor, either you know, at the early stages of fire or later on into the fire, they're going to end up on the floor. They're not going mm. to stay where they are. 
okay? So at least the majority of the ceiling is going to end up on the floor. And any cables that are up in that ceiling are going to end up coming down with it. Yeah. Okay. Right. Now, the actual structure of the ceiling, the tiles and the, the, the bits of aluminium and stuff like that, okay, they'll fall on the floor and you can trample over those, right? But it's the cabling that you get tangled up in. You know, it's, it's this, this big mesh of spaghetti that you get tangled up in with your feet and your breathing apparatus set and it's hanging in midair. And, mm -hmm. and that, is, that is the real issue. It's mm -hmm. cabling. Okay. Okay. Well, that's so. I think towards the end of this, we're going to talk about our opinions. I'll, I've got the Code Breaker book as well, and we'll talk about how we handle this on the ICRs or what our opinions are. Okay. So, um, a couple of bits that were caught for this for the Rule 43 here. It was recommended that all the fire services and social housing providers consider the Rule 43 recommendations by the coroner for Hertfordshire for uh, Mr. Edward Thomas. This is obviously from one of the preceding cases. The um, SBC should remove all surface. This is, uh, I believe, Stevenage Borough Council, I think, which was the local authority for one of these cases, the Harrow Court one, I believe. Yeah. Should remove all the surface mounted plastic trunking conduit used to protect and support the fire alarm and automatic fire detection system in common areas of all their premises and replace them with a method of support, which is a minimum conforms to 5839 part one. Now, here's a problem I have with this. Um, we think about fire efficiency for fire alarm cables but it's all about allowing the system to stay in operation for the event of an escape yeah or well, the alarm to stay in operation while people get out yeah and that's that's understandable yeah the system has to maintain integrity for everyone to escape but we can't just point this out for 5839 part one we need to say is these guys have picked up in chat you know there's security alarm there's data cable there's mains power cable it's any cable if we're considering the risk of premature collapse that may then result in firefighters not being able to get out of a firefighting activity yeah so you know the integrity of a fire alarm is irrelevant it's integrity of the support infrastructure for all cabling fire alarm systems emergency lighting systems yeah, it's all about evacuation. It's about getting people out of the building. That needs to happen in the first few minutes of a fire. Mm. Okay, once they've done their job, then they are obsolete pretty much. Uh, in some of the sort of clever fire alarm systems, you might have a situation where a fire alarm system can actually show you the growth of a fire and the spread of a fire from mm. a control panel point of view. But from a very from a firefighting point of view, yeah, they're it's, it's pretty much. In, um, useless information you're just going to get in there and you're going to sort of put the fire out um so the actual systems themselves just need to maintain operation long enough for people to evacuate then they become part of the problem yeah because if they're not supported properly they can actually do more harm than good along with all the data cabling and the communication cables and all the electrical cables and everything else so again we've got to look at the support of the cabling yeah um, yes, it's got to do its job in the first place, but it only needs to be able to maintain sort of operation for a, a, matter, a short matter of time. Mm -hmm. After that, okay, we, it then becomes an issue. It then becomes a, a pain in the backside. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so a bit more information. It's recommended building uh, regulations are amended to ensure that all cables, not just fire alarm cables, are supported by fire-resistant cable supports. This could be achieved by an amendment to BS7671. Social housing providers should also be encouraged to consider the retrofitting of sprinklers in all existing high-rise buildings in excess of 30 metres in height, particularly those identified by fire rescue services having complex designs that make firefighting more hazardous and or difficult. Um, especially in social housing, it is something that is always evolving. It, it, it's, I mean, they don't even like communal fire alarms going up go, uh, for social housing these days due to false alarms. You know, we have this stay put policy as well now, um, which has obviously had a huge discussion point, um, which oh, we could uh, go down been, the avenue of. Always been an issue. Remember that uh, in the fire service, uh, most fire engines will cover a 13, uh, carry a 13 and a half metre ladder. That's about 50 foot. That goes yeah. up to about four, four floors. Okay. Yeah. Beyond that, you're looking for an aerial lift platform, an ALP. That will go up to 10 floors. If you live higher than that, learn how to fly. Shame. And it, this this is the problem, is that once we get over 10 floors, we can't actually have, we haven't got anything in the fire brigade, but we'll actually get you out of there. So this business of staying put, you know, again, it's one of those, and I've seen various videos of various sort of uh, bits of research into this, and it's one of these emotive issues. 
in some cases it might have saved lives in other cases it might have cost lives um, but it's not it's not the perfect answer and it needs looking into yeah and the problem is i mean as we, we, we can't blame the fire brigade because no. oh, you know they're doing their best you know with the yeah. with the information and the research and and everything that they, they're given at the time remember that all these again, things develop over years but again you've got you've got things like building control and all these officers that will say staying put is best the building is constructed to specific standards so the fire brigade should just stay you know let them all stay put and obviously you see what happened with Grenfell where clearly where there were some issues with the, you know, on paper it works, but in reality it didn't. And obviously then you end up with the firefighters being blamed or given some level of accountability for what's happened. It's absolutely disgusting. The thing is a building design is, is exactly that. It's a design. It's a design. Yeah? So the first thing is, has it actually been installed to that design? Mm. And quite often we find buildings that aren't actually done to design. They've been altered. Secondly, has the installation practice, has it been completed properly and, and efficiently all the way through? And quite often with buildings, towards the end, they cut corners because they want to get the buildings up and in use. Yeah. yeah. Thirdly, has it been regularly inspected and, and checked? Okay. Fourth, has there been any construction works or any other works that have taken place within that building, you know, that have been ordered by the owner or the occupiers or whatever? And then has there been any other issues, i.e. if you've got something like social housing, you know, the, the local housing authority or the council may order certain works to be done by contractors and they sort of manage that. But mm. then you've got the people living there that might end up doing something else, you exactly. know, which nobody knows about. So why haven't we got regular inspection and testing? And we've been on about inspection and testing of social housing, rented accommodation for donkey's years, you know. And how many more people have we got to kill before it actually becomes a reality, you know, it's, and this is one of the big issues. Um, I, when I was at fire service college in Morton and Marsh many years ago, yeah, as a young junior officer, um, the one lecture I always remember was given by a guy from um, Manchester. He was a station officer in Manchester and he showed us all the major bits of legislation in fire safety that have come out over the last 50 years. And then he put up on the board all the major fires that have caused losses of life over the same period of time and what you tend to do is you kill a lot of people yeah and then you learn from it and you bring in changes then you kill a load more people and you learn from that and you bring in changes uh, some of the older guys might remember the bradford city football ground yeah 56 mm. people died there you know after that about four years after the fire safety at sports ground act came in Okay, we had the King's Cross Underground, 21 people died there. After that, we had this business of bringing in um, low smoke, zero halogen uh, cables in public places. So, you know, we learn the hard way. And this is the problem, is that we don't take the right action until it really, really, really smacks us in the face. Mm. Now, we've got the opportunity now. You know, we've had a number of guys die, a number of firefighters die, die from this. You know, can we not learn... From this you know how many more have got to die before we start changing our practices yeah okay all right so to just kind of get the back end of this this is um information from the bre building research establishment and this is actually taken from an article which i'll, I'll show at the end which is freely available for you to download this was the testing carried out on fire and premature collapse and the conditions so they recreated a corridor and a room and they put up some cables and you can see there's an illustration here of five cable erection methods. So you've got to the very right hand side, a typical twin and earth, PVC twin and earth clip. We then have, what do you think this is? This is obviously a metal clip, plastic encoded, maybe for pyro or something. It doesn't detail what they are, unfortunately. If any guys in the chat know what this thing is, let me know, because I, 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 I'm not sure. This is obviously a saddle conduit. And another clip so these are obviously metal and this is mostly plastic the test conditions was standard 1.5 mil tw uh, flat twin or PC, uh, cpc pvc sheath cable five types of supports fixed with zinc plated hardened steel seven and a uh, one quarter inch twin thread screws to fix the concrete lintels used with the same screws and plastic plugs five supports at each per lintel at 300 mil spacings uh, David says that's for the internal clip in trunking D line clips. Okay, thanks, guys. That's great. So the experiments carried out. 
We had one with 0 0.7 megawatts wood crib. What's a wood crib, Pop? Muted. <laughs> yeah, wood crib is basically a, a, what they used to do was um, they'd have a, a crib and they would load it up with uh, wood, usually pallets, old pallets. And they would just stock it up with a certain amount of wood. And obviously, the more combustible material you put in there, the, the more energy, fire energy you'd get in the actual building. So okay. it's like a, a contained way to re replicate a yeah, it's, it's, serial it's, fire. It, it's a contained, controlled way of creating a fire. Yeah. Okay. Uh, obviously, when you when you're doing training in the fire service college and various other places, they're, they're, most fire um, fire services have a, a firehouse where they do the training. Now they've got one yeah. down at Whitley Wood in, in Reading, uh, and you get fires in there. They set fire to. Obviously, you're chucking guys into a building which is which is on fire, so you need to have that managed. And there's a lot of health and safety goes into it. Having these cribs in a controlled place in a controlled location with a certain amount of uh, wood loading into them is a way of managing those fires for training and research uh, situations. Okay. So the first experiment is 0.7 megawatts. These are energy levels, obviously, of the intensity here. And experiment two is 1.3. So I'm not, I mean, I'm gonna show you where you can get this so you can have a good research for yourself. And I did use this in the video that I did. So in the first ex experiment, which was um, 0.7, We've got timber lintel, concrete, timber, and concrete. So four lintels. We've got the average maximum temperature at the lintels, actually average temperature at the clips where they were observed to drop to so the point of dropping. Um, and then the supports themselves. So support one, two, three, four, and five, which I'm going to assume means one, two, three, four, five, because five is the twin and earth clip, yeah. which is a clip here. Um, can can yeah. I just add to that, that that looking at those temperatures, okay, that's not that's not excessive. That's a a pretty mild fire. Yeah. Okay. So all of these supports here, which we think have metallic parts to them, are fine. The clips clearly have had problems with these lintels. And here's the image. So we've got obviously, yeah, this is this is showing evidence that a twin earth clip surface mounted just basically plastic fixings all together drops, whilst these other fixings that are a variety of metal, um, either metal all altogether or metal coated with plastic, actually held up. So the second experiment obviously increased this to 1.3 megawatts, and you can see that's therefore a much higher temperature. Is that is that? Representative pop, is that all right? That's a, that's a bit more like it. Um, if you consider a normal um, a normal sort of house with normal sort of furniture in it, uh, in, a, in, a, in a room like a, a living room or something like that, you would expect, you expect once the fire's developed, and we're talking about not ages, we're talking about within maybe about five, six minutes, mm. yeah? Um, you would expect the temperatures to be rising to those sorts of levels at ceiling level. Yeah, but obviously at ceiling level, your temperature is going to be higher than at floor level. Um, mm -hmm. But when you're looking at fire growth and fire temperatures, uh, I've got a few figures here. Um, yeah, uh, 300 about head height, uh, up at the ceiling, you're looking at about five or 600, uh, and even up to a thousand degrees, depending on how much furniture and how much loading you've got in the room. Yeah. So those, temp those temperatures there are, yeah, they're, they're, they're moderate. They're moderate for a, a room fire. Okay, good. Okay, so in this case, obviously, all the clips have failed. Uh, and we have one of the lintels in particular where three of the fixing supports have failed. And you can see more intensity, and it's, you know, yeah, it looks much more devastating. All the insulation material has gone from the cables. It's just cables held up now, except for the fifth one. They then to, also, yep. Sorry, just to give you a bit, uh, a, a bit of an idea, if that did get to flashover position, you know, the point of flashover, which is fairly common, yeah, uh, at flashover, you're looking at temperatures of about 1,200 plus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are, these are obviously the, uh, the measurement thermocouples here. Okay, so they did that for clipping. They also did a fixings experiment, standard aerated 3.6... Newton concrete block of dimensions, four, four mil, a, a, a big concrete block 
Each horizontally placed into an oven on top of two other blocks placed vertically as supports to allow for the suspension of weights from the fixing. So they put an applied weight on the fixing. Steel bolts were used as weights attached to the fixings used in steel wire. And the fixings experimented with were one, a countersunk six mil by 45 mil concrete screw. Two, a multi-purpose twin thread countersunk zinc plated screw with a five mil lightweight plastic wall plug. Three, a hammer in fixing with nylon plug with drive in screw. Four, a multi purpose twin thread countersunk zinc plated screw with a nylon wall plug. And five, the typical sleeve anchor medium weight use. So these were put under the weight in the temperature. That's, pri that's pre, so we have obviously, you know, fixings one, two, three, four, five there to match one, two, three, four, five here. Okay. And then results of this, the oven temperature at 100 degrees, maximum temperature in the, in the block 58, all intact. Oven temperature 200, the block temperature 104, intact. And we can see when we get to a oven temperature of three with a block temperature of 100, we get some weakened impact on fixing two. And when we go up to 400, which is a 109 block temperature, we have fixing two weakened, fixing three weakened, and fixing four fails. That's at 400 degrees. Oven temperature 400 degrees, the temperature in the block, which is obviously the material at 109, the fixing fails. Okay. Yeah. So, and then the, the next picture shows you that, and obviously there's the, the, the fourth one. These, this is representative of the anchors. Yeah, it's a, it's a mass. Four's not there because four failed. Yeah, four failed yeah. at 400 degrees. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> the conclusion was for this report, quite simply, readily available supports and fixes capable of withstanding temperatures greater than 600 degrees can be sufficient to avoid cables falling. So the fixings need to be able to accommodate greater than 600 degrees, which you can see these didn't. didn't plastic. Okay, and this raises a question about plastic plugs because yep. I looked at this evidence and I've said about plastic rule plugs and obviously there's been a lot of kickback from some people in the industry because of obviously stakeholders and all this other thing. Some people in the industry are trying to raise awareness of the fact that some plastic rule plugs have failed the tests. Some have tried to actually question the authenticity of this um, and you know, I lost a lot of respect for those organizations when they did that. But this is a report. Uh, you can get it at this link here. I will put it on social media if you want to, but it's from a conference. It's a presentation at a conference. You can Google for it. It's the uh, BRE Fire Conference 2015. It's from 2015, and it's called Assessing the Impact on Some Electrical Cable Supports and Fixings. It's a little case study that they did. Um, and it is on that link, which I will, um, I will put a link, a little share link or something. Okay. Good idea. Um, so I've obviously been very much pro fixing methods that are not going to use plastic rule plus because I've read that and I've thought about it myself and I conclude if I can use fixing methods that are not plastic rule plugs, I would like to, it's just a case of them being accessible. Uh, Linian, I see someone's mentioned Linian good. I've spoken with Linian a lot. I've got a bag of them here. Um, they're great and they do work, um, but they are, they are, I'm going to speak, I'm going to speak, they are getting a lot of, um, a lot of issues with uh, other people saying, oh, you know, plastic are fine, plastic are fine. And they're trying to get people to actually do the work themselves, trying to do some research. And we should, we should. Um, and it is frustrating. So where does this leave us moving forward? Now, somebody mentioned the Napit Code Breaker book. Um, I'll mention that. My, my name's in that book, so I will mention it. Um, it's a C2 or a C3, basically. Is that what they say in Napit? Yep, yeah, and that's basically, if, if this, is the, this is the wording, okay? If the trunking conduit is installed without a means of support for premature collapse in the event of a fire, C2. But then it's written again, but unlikely to cause an entanglement hazard, C3. So that's the query. The query is, I mean, for example, if I've got a cable that's up and the cable will drop, but it's not in a route of walking, the question is, how do we determine if it can create an entanglement hazard? That's, that's the query. So they're, they're basically, they're saying, yes, it's C2, but it's also C3. It depends on if there is a risk of entanglement. Um, 
What's your opinion? Well, this is a this is always a question, isn't it? Is that um, when you're looking at this, um, the short answer would be C two, because um, you know it's potentially it, dangerous. It, it's, it's potentially dangerous. Yeah. Um, so my short answer to this would be yeah, I'll, I'm going to C two it. Um, however. However, there's a lot of howevers to this, isn't there? Um, one of the big issues is, and uh, I've had lots of questions about this. Okay, you you put it to a, a C2, uh, and now you've basically said, okay, this electrical installation is unsatisfactory. Um, so what are they going to do about it? Well, if it's some locations, it's very easy to retrospectively go in and put a few... Mm. Um, of the like the linear clips, yeah, which are yeah. which are really good. You know, there's a drill work, a hole, yeah. pop them in. They they pop work and they're good. And you haven't got um, to replace every fixing. No, this is it. Is the fact no. that you only need to fix one every now and then. I, I think, think there's a uh, there was by, a comment earlier on. Some uh, one yeah. of the guys said, you know, every fourth clip. Yeah. And yeah, but if you consider, okay, if we can hold those cables up, you don't need to do it every. You know, look at the spacing in the on-site guide. You don't need to look at that. Yeah. But every now and then, you need to have that metal support in there just to stop the cables from falling down. Yeah. So if it is easy to do that, then retrospectively, why don't we see to it and get those things in? Yeah. All right. The issue um, then comes with what about mm -hmm. if we can't get into it? What if we can see it across the ceiling? Yeah. But we can't actually access it without taking the ceiling down. Uh. And this is one of the issues we have with the coding. The current coding we've got only gives us the two options. We can either see to it and say, this is unsatisfactory. Yeah. We've got to do something. Or we can see through it, which is, as we know, for most places, they'll ignore it. And this, yeah. is, this is where I don't like the way it is right now, because we've always said, you know, you know, BS7671, when there are updates to regulations, they're not retrospective, which means installations that we installed a year ago are not suddenly unsafe because we've got a new device that says we should now use this. This regulation, however, has been in introduced due to not technology development, not due to change. It's due to, yeah, it's due to an issue that has been in place, you know, the past 10, 20 years. We've got self-sticky 25 to 16 oh, trucks going up yeah. in cheap contracts, no good workmanship, poor installations. This has to be given some retrospective consideration. Yeah, we Probably, know it's killing people. But, yeah, the problem is we don't want to start saying installations that we said were satisfactory five years ago are now unsatisfactory, and suddenly the observations we're now making were there five years ago. But unfortunately, they are. Unfortunately, they are. And now we've got this problem, uh, and it really does. And also, it really does result in the the inspector needs to speak with the person who is in charge of fire risk management at the client site. If you go into a factory or something like that, whoever's in charge of fire risk assessment, fire risk, they also have, they've got that, that duty to make sure that if there is a fire, everybody's out, everyone's accounted for, and the fire authority, the firefighters that then come are also protected. And that means making sure that they are given the right information. And we need to let them know if an installation can prematurely collapse on them and stop the firefighters coming out. We need to try to retrospectively find a way to stop that risk. We can't right now start installing them properly from now and say to a firefighter, oh, well, if you go that way, stick to the left because the cables won't drop on the left, but over the other side, they may. We can't, we can't do that. We've got to start retrospectively going back and making some modifications. We must support clients with some kind of gradual improvement, I think. Yeah. yeah. And as you say, I, 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 there are questions. What do you think about spacing? I mean, is it like, do you think every fourth fixing, is it as simple as that? I mean, if the ceiling's high, I mean, fundamentally... Depends, as, depends as, on the height of the ceiling, doesn't it? Yeah. As the code breaker book says, if there's no risk of entanglement, then let's say a cable goes through the wall up high and then goes through the wall up high, and if you got rid of all the fixings, the cable's just going to sag. It isn't going to come across the walkway. It's going to come nowhere near head height. There's no doorway or something. It's not going to cross anything. Then there's probably no problem because the masonry of the building is holding that cable up. Mm -hmm. But if it's then going to drop lower than that head height where a firefighter would walk in that, you know, it's in the thing. Because you said, I mean, I go into a room. I go into a room. I go through a door. We've been told doorways. I go through a door. I see another doorway. So do I think a firefighter could go into a room and go, Door, door, I'll walk straight. 
So if there's a cable going dangling down over there, they're not going to walk that way. But you've told me if there's nothing to see, the firefighter is going to stick to the wall. They have to stick to the wall because they've right. got nothing else to guide them. So if I'm in a room and I see there's a door and a door, the cable's not going to entangle, but those cables there could, but he's not going to go that way because he can see there's no doorway there. There's nowhere to search and rescue over there. He's not going to see that, he or she. They're going to feel their way around that room. So they will potentially go ways that we don't think they're going to go because we think they're going to go the way we see, but they don't see that. And this is the education. This is the education we need as inspectors to help us understand the risk factor here for firefighters. Yeah. You know, and I'm oh, not yeah. seeing the industry providing it. Well, I've said this to people before when I do, when I was in the fire service, giving fire safety talks, you know, when you consider what firefighters have to work in, mm. you know, people, it's, it's very difficult to put yourself in that situation. So I said to people, well, when you go home, go in through your front door, shut your eyes. Hmm. And then find yourself, find your way up into the, your bedroom, yeah, with your eyes shut. Yeah. Right? And even when you are very the familiar with the building, because you live there and you've lived there for donkey's years, it is very difficult to do that. Space, yeah, loses all meaning. You think something's only like a couple of feet away. When you've got your eyes shut and you're feeling for it, it feels like yards and yards and yards. So you lose that whole sort of aspect of, distance okay mm. yeah go into a building and shut your eyes and find your way in and out of it right this is what the, the firefighters are working in now one of the we are as electricians we are blinkered yeah we are given this document are we going to see three are we going to see to it well actually the document is not fit for purpose yeah. for this particular situation okay. what we've got to do is take our blinkers off yeah Go back to electricity at work regulations. Go back to health and safety at work. Yeah. If we see something which is potentially dangerous or potentially hazardous, we have a duty of care. Yeah. To take action. If we ignore it and somebody gets hurt because of that, then we are just as much at fault. Mm. As electricians going into a building, we've seen the cables up in ceiling spaces and other areas unsupported should that building develop a fire should firefighters have to work in that area that will cause a hazard and a danger to them we are aware of that we have a duty of care because under the health and safety at work act we've seen something which is dangerous and potentially dangerous we have a duty of care to take action but it doesn't fit the remit we've given is it a c2 is it a c3 and this is where a risk assessment a report to the building mm. owner to say look from an electrical point of view, this is what we found, but you have a situation here with these cables. Yeah, I've done a separate risk assessment for that. These are the areas where the cables are a danger. We can't get to those to get those supports in there. They need to then put that on their fire risk assessment for the building. Yeah, so that when a fire develops, if a fire occurs, when the fire service turn up, they can say to the fire service, oh, by the way, there are unsupported cables in there. You might want to add that into your risk assessment. Do you really want to send guys in? Yeah. yeah. And that is the only way. Other than removing ceilings and taking floors and ceilings up and down, basically ripping the building apart just so we can get in to put these fixings back in. Mm. You know, Where we can do it, where we can reach, we can put the occasional fixing in. Use a linear clip or something to, you know, linear are good. All right, I, I've used them. Yeah, but use something like that every now and then to support the cables. And how, how often? Well, it depends on the height of the ceiling, depends on the size of the cable. Yeah, so we can use common sense, we can risk assess it, and we can do it from there. But, you know, that tight document, that's that narrow sort of corridor in the document, C2 or C3, it doesn't work. It doesn't fit for this purpose. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not correct. We need to step beyond that, right? And the only way to do that in the given tools that we've got is to do a risk assessment and put it on there in my point of view yeah no, yeah that makes perfect sense i mean there's a couple of comments there going along the lines of you know we need to have a separate risk assessment a separate a separate approach to account for this problem to quantify it to make people aware of it there was mentioned that we could maybe have something like an asbestos register alternative you know so yeah. there's awareness there's awareness that's the key 
um there has to be a level of awareness and then that awareness like asbestos it's okay we know where it is we know if we know where it is great and then gradually we can know where it is to then gradually remove it and that's the same here if we can identify where the risk is then we can at least give some level of support to firefighters if there is a potential fire rescue service activity and in the right. meantime we can financially prepare a way to remedy you know if we do any other work we can take that opportunity to then improve that risk and remove it yeah. Um, last couple of slides and then we'll have a little conclusive chat and look at these questions so things for electricity to consider you've just done a great little bit there um try and assist and support anyone in your client's organization who has a responsibility for fire risk management fire risk assessments they may not be aware of this that's my experience they may not be aware of this okay landlords local authorities housing associations all of them there will be i mean how many of you guys i've seen it before you know you've popped your head up and see you're trying to make your job look neat and you can't help but notice the data or the fire even these other wiring systems there would be a 7671 there's a mention obviously in the 5839 standard as well but you know does the message get across to all these other standards these other requirements do they even read them well again come back to risk assessment even yeah. if your cables are supported, but you see other people's cables, like the data, the communications and stuff like that, and they're unsupported, bang it on a risk assessment, give yeah. it to the customer and say, look, all our stuff is absolutely perfect. We're wonderful. But your data installers and your communications installers need a back size kit, basically. You know, yeah. And you put that on a risk assessment and give it to them. You've got it all documented now. I always say that, and I've, I've mentioned this to you, should something happen, should something occur, you know, Am I happy to stand next to that person's family, their, you know, their, their, their husband and children or their wives and children and say, mm. look, I did everything I could, yeah? I was aware of the situation. I did everything I could to make it safe. Now, if I can't look them in the eye and say that, then I haven't done my job. Yeah, and right now, if anything happens tomorrow and a corridor gets involved, he'll do his research, you'll find those Rule 43s, he'll find that the building regulations were contacted, they'll find that BS 761 had a new regulation come in, they'll find that it was updated in 2018, they'll then go back to that contractor who will then provide a report that says satisfactory with no information about this. Yeah? The system has come round to put into our regulations an attempt to stop this happening again. That's what's happened. The coroners have done the work. It's all gone around. They've done their work. Regulators have done their work. Manufacturers have done their work by producing things for us to go with. We now need to obviously decide how to work moving forwards. Okay, um, that brings the end of the presentation. Let's go through the questions to see what, if anyone wants to. Uh, well, what we got here? Okay. Um, oh, good. Um, do -do 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 -do. All right, Ben, this can be answered at the end, no problem at all. Uh, has there been any guidance as to what is suitably spaced? I generally use either a third or fourth clip. The problem I find when saying fixing steel or armor, using a metal fixing, etc., all round band or linear is generally on a different fixing center, causing an uneven run. So it makes yeah. it look a bit odd. Yeah. So causing an uneven, I mean, so in that scenario, I would. If I had to, if I tried to do just one in four or one in three, I would see if the one that I could do would be one that is not obviously, you know, right in the center eye view, so because it would look funny. Um, I would maybe put a cleat. I don't know. I'd put a cleat next to one if 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 it works. I don't know because it does hold it a bit tighter to the wall. Linear clips hold it a bit more snug to a cleat. There's spacing there. You know, you, see what, you know what he's trying to say there, but yeah. Yeah, and it all depends obviously on the much, size. Closer to the wall. Yeah, you've also got to consider the size and the weight of the cable. Yeah. Uh, and how much it's going to sag down. So, you know, you look at each cable and have to gauge it on its own sort of merits. Uh, you know, it's... one way of sort of looking at it is you can actually play with the stretch of cable and say, well, if I put a support in here and I'll put another support in that far away, how much is this going to dangle down? Um, and obviously, depending on the height of the ceiling, that's the other thing is, if you've got a fairly low ceiling, you need to keep those cables fairly tight to the ceiling. If you've got a ceiling which is sort of like 20 feet up in the air, then it's yeah. not going to be so much of an issue if it dang does dangle down a foot or so. Uh, so there's, you've got to look at each one and its merits. Trying to make it look nice, yeah, I get, you, get what you're saying with the, the linear clips and the cable cleats are going to be slightly, you know, going to be off, off centre and stuff like that. Mm. But perhaps fix with the cleats for neatness and presentation and perhaps put a linear clip or similar. We keep saying linear, 
Why not? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's because I have a pack in front of me. Sorry. Yeah, um, yeah, fire, yeah. fire clip. Why not? Fly, fire Why not? Clip. They're British. They're, they're British made. Let's stick with that. Go, um, go, guys in chat, enter a couple of others so I can obviously make sure there's a bit of neutrality here. <laughs> yeah, but um, um, yeah, we're not we're not paid by linear, no. honestly. Um, but they're just one that we're aware of. Well, I have. Do. I'll be perfectly honest. I have spoken with the guys at Linear because they have tried this plastic rule plug. They've tried to show people this information, and they have. Some people have tried to shut them down on that. I'm not going to speak on who who has done what, but people have tried to say you got to align with our point of view, and I've said that's absolute. If, at the end of the day, if they've, done their, if they've done their work and they've come up with their own opinion, then they stand to their own opinion on these things. So yeah. I completely agree with yeah. them on it. Anybody that's mm. used linear, I keep saying, linear clips, well, no, it's it's just drill a hole, put it in. So mm. you, you haven't got to like drill a hole, put a fix it in, then screw in. It's just a drill a hole, fix it in. So perhaps use your normal cleats and and, and clips for uh, presentation purposes and for support the cable in normal use, and then put the occasional one in to cover it for this the, this business of uh, of collapse um, yeah 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 I agree. you know all right it, it might take you another couple of minutes but um for, you know for a section of cable but it's a couple of minutes well spent if you're going to save somebody's life okay um nigel says what i don't understand is how inspectors are still coding unclipped cables with pvc trunking above escape routes as only a c3 and they say well the regs aren't retrospective i i agree um yeah, totally this is something that i've uh, i've tried to passionately get across in this talk this respect re retrospectiveness i sat i sat with a food manufacturer i was there to deliver a talk on thermal imaging and solar because they were going to install a large megawatt array and there was some other guy who was there to talk about 70th edition amendment three and he covered this area in about three minutes and the lady in charge of health and safety who i was about three seats down from said she put her hand up and he said, yeah, yeah. He said, so, uh, but the regulations normally aren't retrospective. He said, yeah, this isn't retrospective. You haven't got to do anything. You don't need to look at it for the new design. And I just, I just face palmed. I was like, you're just giving the wrong information here. You know, yeah. there's a much bigger, there's a much, and he didn't say anything about the names of the firefighters, the events, the case studies. So we don't understand why it's just a new regulation. Um, so we don't connect with it. And that's why I did this video two years ago. We've got to look at the people who have died and we've got to learn from that and we've got to try to stop that happening anymore. Um, the as, I say, as, I, as I say, I've already mentioned, you know, don't just look at the electrical wiring rigs, look at health and safety, look at electrical work regulations. Yeah. It's clearly an issue under those. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I agree. So let's not let's take the blinkers off, guys. This is the problem, though. The problem is our other stuff. the problem is our reporting is to be a seven six seven one. It's time that we kind of evolved it a little bit. Maybe we start introducing a little bit more uh, reporting that introduces seven six seven, but some other yeah. thing as well. Um, Raphael says, "Yeah, the regs need to be made retrospective to bring the appealing systems we find up to date." As we know, they won't bother as it will cost money. That yeah, this kind of yeah, this, this is, the is problem, always the, issue, the this, excuse, isn't it? And this will affect the words that are spoken to us by our industry bodies, because other people have invested interests in things not being changed, in not changing the the uh, direction that we're going in, and that yeah. does mute advice and it does mute competence. And I'm going to say it: it mutes competence and it stops us actually taking this seriously and moving forwards. Uh, how far would you go on an EICR when it comes to premature collapse? So I think we've covered that. This is obviously from um, earlier on. Um, we've, we've talked about the fact that it's all about, I mean, EICR is restrictive. It's very restrictive in its code. It's restrictive in what we can put on it. Um, and as I say, I would try to talk or try to do a report. Uh, there's been mentions there of a, an asbestos register type scenario, a risk yeah. assessment scenario, yeah. where you can actually make the clients aware of a regulation. You can even, you know, you can even reference Rule 43. You can reference the background to it to make the client have that access to the resource. And you can then tell them where the installation is going to potentially be dangerous for firefighters and a fire rescue activity. If it's an area that isn't actually going to be searched or rescued because of the use of the building, they can lower the level of risk. If it is a well-populated area, then obviously it's going to have an inc increased level of risk. That's the point about risk assessment. You've mentioned dynamic. It is dynamic and this is dynamic. And you we, know, we, we can put working. codes in print. We can put codes in print, yeah. but sites are different. Yeah. We were working on an installation a few weeks ago. Uh, mm -hmm. You were with me. We were doing an EICR on that, um, 
Um, obviously, all this is, is none of this is testing. This is all inspection stuff, looking for support of cables. Um, and we fo we followed. We had about eighty four FBs coming out of that yeah. switch room. Yeah, eighty four of them all together, and mm -hmm. they came out of the switch room. They were clipped up in the switch room. They Nicely came done. Through all nice, and neat. Yeah. Oh, lovely, lovely to look at. And they came out across the top of the door, and then they came out into a corridor, and then went down a corridor, and then into an open restaurant area. Okay, and it was all uh, fixed ceiling, but there was the occasional hatch every sort of 20 meters or so, so you could see all this cabling, and it was all held up by plastic, uh, plastic cable ties, mm -hmm. yeah, which obviously would, would fail under fire conditions, um, and if the, if the ceiling came down, then the, 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 the cables would come down as well. The ceiling was all plasterboard, held up with very light framework, so that was, yeah, it would probably last about half an hour or so in an intense fire. Um, and we looked at that and, you know, it was all inspection items. It was all looking across the ceiling, looking through these hatches, looking to see where the cables were, looking to see where the cables were supported by walls. You know, so if they go across a corridor and you've got mm -hmm. a couple of foot, yeah, and then it goes across another doorway, that's, they're being held up by the building fabric. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't such an issue. It's when it got down, the, as it's following the actual route of the corridor, and then out into the open space. Mm. That's so there's where going, really there's going to be a span, and this is what we could probably do with yeah. more guidance on. Let's say I've got a wall to a wall and I'm going through the building fabric. There'll be a point where we're going to say, right, if the distance between those two walls has now achieved X amount of distance, the potential for that cable will drop to a height that is now conceived to be a potential danger for a firefighter. And we need guidance written that's going to give us that extra information. So when we're on site, so we can actually be given some level of direction to then fill a risk assessment with, you know? Because if obviously that span is then greater than that, we then install some method of fixings. Um, okay, um, there's Dale. I've encountered contractors on numerous occasions asking if they can mount the metal tray upside down because it will be easier to install the cabling. Surely these horrifying stories should stop this question from being asked in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, so instead of having a basket or a tray the right way up, they put it there so they can put it underneath. And then um, technically, yeah. oh, that's crap. Technically, if you then, you then have to have all metal ties or you'd have some. some you'd have to have of, at um, least a number of metal number supports, of them, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Andy's mentioned the Code Breaker. Yes, um, Code Breaker book. It's right now with the, again, Right now, the way BS7671 and the coding is done, things like this where we start to look in more detail at the root cause and the purpose and the intent of regulations, the way coding is done really does restrict us to make decisions that we do or do not want to make. You know, We don't want to say something is C2, unsatisfactory, and wind up a client when you know, four years ago we said it was fine. We don't want to do that, so we want to C3 it, but we shouldn't want to code things. The coding should be determined by our assessment of risk. Um, they've been fair. They've been. I mean, they've done all they can in the code breaker book. It's got to be considered a C two because it is potentially dangerous. They've added the option of the C three if your conclusion that that drop would not result in an entanglement. But they need to add to this, as you've heard here talking to Phil. Firefighters don't go walking from door to door when they're in a room doing search and rescue. They don't walk door to door. They walk around a boundary or a border they feel round and that's something that isn't in there for us to then assess what the likelihood of entanglement is so how can we as electricians competently determine what the likelihood of entanglement is the other thing which i didn't mention is that when you it's what we used to call to be a BA shuffle um uh, when firefighters are searching because they can't see uh, and they're following a wall as they walk they will sweep their feet side to side checking the floor so this unlike a, a so floor. unlike you and me we'll step probably over and above things mm. a firefighter will sweep their feet across the floor feeling for the floor as they go this is to make sure the floor is still there because obviously if the yeah. fire is underneath that floor it might have burned away and the, and the floor might have collapsed so a firefighter is sweeping their feet backwards and forwards across the floor now you imagine cables on that floor as a firefighter is sweeping their feet across, their feet are gonna be sweeping those cables across and tangling up in those cables. We would step over them because we can see what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. if you've got a load of cables, you know, when you're installing or ripping cables out on rewire, 
you, all the cables end up on the floor and we step over them. It's fine, we can see what we're doing. You imagine having to walk across that floor with no vision and you've got to feel the floor as you go, your feet are gonna get tangled up. So, you know, you've got to try and think what these guys are, and, and girls are going through when they're actually searching buildings. Yeah, it's in no way at all can we accept wiring systems falling down. Yeah, mm -hmm. the collapse of, fire, of wiring systems is a complete no-no. And, you know, my last sort of point on it is, and we said this before on a number of issues we've been doing over these last couple of weeks on these webinars, we've got to accept as electricians, yeah, that the documentation that we are using and that we are given from the IET and various other people, um, it's not actually always fit for purpose, okay? And I've said it a number of times, and David said it a number of times, you guys, you know, you know what you're doing, you're experienced, you're, you've got really good common sense, you've got really good sort of engineering sort of acumen. Make your own decisions. Don't be afraid to go beyond what is given to you in the way of documentation. Make up a risk assessment, attach it to your documents, okay? We need to go that further step now. David's got this term, hasn't it? Level up, yeah? And this is all part of it. We know that the system isn't good enough. We know that the documentation isn't good enough. It's not fit for purpose for this particular aspect of uh, installations. We need to level up. We need to step beyond that. Have the confidence in your own ability, guys, because you know what you're doing. You're good. You, you, you know, there's some cracking electricians out there. Believe in yourself. Do these risk assessments. Attach them to your documents. There's lots of good chat and there's lots of people ask, you know, helping each other out of the chat, which is really good. C C C three. Um Barry says on any ICR where escape routes are noted that don't have suitable support for wiring systems, the fire brigade should be noted as well. And again, when remedial follow up or even be present. So this is again, this is why I, I say you know the whoever's in charge of the installation, we need to make sure. The, 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 the person who most likely is going to be in communication with the local fire brigade will be the fire risk management because there needs to be that liaison where the fire risk manager will obviously coordinate with the local fire authority about actions and planning. So make sure the fire person in charge of fire risk management for the factory or the building, maybe one person, maybe a responsible person, but make sure they get the information about this regulation and about the cause of it and any existing dangers that occur and what st best strategies are for them to be able to work with them. Yeah. There's an interesting one there from Sean asking me to clarify my opinion of cables above fixed plasterboard ceilings, lost spaces and stuff. Yep. If you're, if you're, if a cable's following the same route as a timber, so it's going parallel with the timbers and it's in the gaps between the timbers. Okay. It would need to be supported. If it's going across the timbers, so the timbers are holding the cable up. Okay. Then the only way that cable's going to come down, if there's an actual structural collapse of the whole building, the actual woodwork, yeah the trouble with plasterboard in buildings is we talk about the you know, fire situation you know plasterboard would last 20 minutes at least what you've got to consider is that the other aspect of fire situations and what firefighters do is they go and chuck a load of water in the building okay so now what you've got is a piece of plaster or a plasterboard ceiling which has been subjected to intense temperatures and then some big airy firefighter has gone in there and splashed loads of water around it to put the fire out so now the, the plasterboard is absolutely sopping wet and at that point it will if it hasn't already it will probably collapse the plasterboard will come away so on the one hand we've got the timber work now if the timber work burns through mm. and and breaks so that you've got a structural collapse mm. then that's a structural collapse and you know that's an issue well firefighters won't be in the building at that point anyway yeah, yeah. But when we've got <clears throat> plasterboard and things like suspended ceilings coming down, if they are supporting cables, then that is an issue because firefighters will still be in the building so at that point. If you were to manage taking a plasterboard ceiling just down, quite yeah. often you'll see cables then end up dangling down. That's the problem. So when we say plasterboard ceilings have 20 minutes, 30 minutes, again, this is all about fire containment to allow people to get out. Get out. But we never think about firefighters coming in and throwing water in, which is then going to make the... I mean, how many times did you ever see that when you were on the pump? Oh, loads. 
Loads. Loads. Okay, you so know? you saw to seeding be, to be down honest, a lot. Yeah. To be honest, um, I shouldn't say this really. I'm probably going to get put in a tower. I'll probably, uh, Windsor, probably ask you to send the hat back. Win, Windsor Castle. Oh, that's damaged anyway. So, oh, right. um, yeah, it got dropped. Um, Windsor Castle. Yeah. Uh, we were there for the whole weekend, and we possibly did as much damage as the fire did because we put so much water on the building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, in an effort to put the fire out, you know, it wasn't gratuitous damage and, and just us being complete vagabonds, yeah. But there was a certain amount of damage that was caused by the amount of water that we poured onto that, yeah. yeah. Um, in ex, you know, way probably probably 50 50, the fire did a certain amount of damage and we did the rest, uh, in, in our efforts to put the fire out. And that's just a, a phenomenon of firefighting within buildings. We go in and we use water. Water's really good at putting fires out, but it, it does affect building fabrics. Okay, so things like plasterboard surfaces and stuff like that will quite often collapse. If they haven't already collapsed when we go in, they'll probably collapse while we're in there, mm -hmm. you know, um, because of the water that we're chucking everywhere. Uh, anybody that's had a leak in their house, um, Kibby did last, last year in Edinburgh, they had a leak from the washing machine upstairs. I remember. Okay? And then, you know, a couple of days later, this took a couple of days, but, you know, the whole ceiling collapsed because of the water that was in the ceiling. So, yeah, we've got the same situation. So it's not just the fire. It's also the firefighting activity that goes on, which has helped to bring plasterboard down. Yeah. If your cables are going at 90 degrees to the timbers, so, so they're being supported so by the timbers. On top of or through joists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they're going at 90 degrees, they're being supported by the joists. Okay. Yeah. We're not so worried about joist collapse because once the joist collapse well the firefighters won't be in there once the building starts to, to fall down the firefighters won't be in there yeah. what we're worried about is that stage of collapse where the plasterboard and, and the soft parts of the building start to collapse and the cables come down with it okay mm -hmm. so if your cables are parallel to the joist in the, in the gullies between and not supported then they are likely to then create a hazard when the plasterboard fails so it's fair to say that saying plasterboard uh, is you know saying cables above a plasterboard are not protected from this regulation because the plasterboard is just as much likely to come down in many of the circumstances. Yes, yeah. where yeah. the cables are wide above. Yeah. As it says, as it says in the uh, guidance note, firefighting activities. Activities. Okay, great. There's, thank you. Right, guys. There's so many uh, cables now. D-line, Erico Caddy fire clip, the walk cable staples. Um, there's links. Uh, yeah, do check them out. Um, David says, Voltam have published a table with cable clip distances. Oh, I'll have a little look for that. Mm. Um, I'm gonna, I'll say it again. I'm skeptical of what a lot of the electrical industry has done with this regulation to properly support electricians and engineers in using it. I'm very frustrated with that. Um, and I can, I can moan about all of them individually with examples of where they've been absolutely f f stupid. I'm not going to. I'm going to just take this information. I'm going to give it to you guys. Thankfully, with the you know we're taking benefit of the opportunities we have, pops come on and offered us the firefighting perspective, which I think is very valuable. I think we've not really had an opportunity to hear about really how firefighters go around, how they fight and tackle buildings, how they're trained. So, pop, thank you for helping me out with this one. No worries. I really, I really felt we had to take an opportunity to discuss this regulation. Um, right, guys, look, if you have any other questions or queries, you know how to contact me. Most of you know, have, have figured out how to contact Phil Watts, Ascot College. Um, you know, we're all here to try to support each other, trying to level up, trying to get a better understanding work from the regulations. Uh, and yeah, hopefully come out of this horrible, horrible situation. Uh, sharp, active, um, and ready to go. Are there any let me see if we've got any questions. Questions here. Okay, uh, Andrew Stains, is it likely that cable will sag when it gets hot as well? It will do because the, the conductor yeah. will expand, so they will sag uh, even if they are effectively supported. But you know, if, if, uh, again, it's one of those things: is uh, how much is it going to sag? It all depends on the weight and size of the conductor and the heat that's been involved. Um, so there's no easy answer for this one. Um, you know, it, it, we don't mind it sagging a little bit. Mm. Uh, it depends on the height of the ceiling as well. So yes, cables will sag just to the expansion uh, and, and, the, uh, and of the cable under 
sort of hot conditions. Awesome. So obviously we need to build that. Yeah. Tank I mean, the images, the images from the BRE study showed they sagging. did actually show that. Yeah, showed yeah. sagging, didn't it? They didn't like add extra length. It was sagging. Yeah. Uh, he also says, are fiber wall plugs available and suitable? Ah, oh, good old fiber wall plugs. They didn't test those, did they? No. I might have some in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Not, not sure the answer to that. I mean, I don't know if we can find them. Uh, maybe, maybe. Okay. Um, great, guys. Um, thanks for taking part. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your engagement. Um, yeah, um, we're going to, our next webinar is Friday where we're carrying on the observations and recommendations. And we're going to try to get through some more of those slides, talk about coding. That's Friday morning at 11. That's yeah. Friday. That's yeah. our next one. Um, yeah, thank you for your time, gentlemen. Uh, ladies, um, message us if you need anything else. Cheers, guys. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Take care.